سيدنا محمد وعلى اله واصحابه اجمعين ومن وعلى من اتبع سنته واقتفى اثره الى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما انك انت العليم الحكيم so with surah al-a'raf we have reached the section that talks or mentions the stories of the prophets and uh, we said this is a big a big chunk of the surah especially the first half of the surah is about the prophets and they are in the common order in the quran uh, starting with prophet nuh uh, yeah Yeah, starting with Prophet Nuh alayhi salam, Ad, Salih sent to Thamud, and uh, then Lut alayhi salam. This is a very common, and finally Shuhayb. This is a very common order of the stories in the Quran when they are mentioned together. And it serves the purpose in the surah that we mentioned is to consult, the, the purpose was to consult the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, that opposition is actually the normal response of the people who are not looking for the truth or the people who are not interested in the truth. And Allah mentions in the Quran, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَا فِي كُلِّ قَرْيَةٍ أَكَابِرَ مُجْرِمِيهَا لِيَمْكُرُوا فِيهَا And thus we have uh, placed in every city, every town, every nation uh, the criminals among them. And again the criminals here who act uh, against the pure human nature of belief and accepting the the truth and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, with the great emphasis these days on human rights and people's feelings and things like that some of it is actually good but it's mixed with a lot of exaggeration in many areas and sometimes immoral uh, stances uh, Somebody might ask, you know, why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, try good people with bad people? Like, why does Allah allow uh, oppressors? Why does Allah allow uh, disbelievers to give the believers a hard time? Why does Allah allow this to happen? Isn't Allah supposed to help the believers? Allah actually mentions in the Quran, Allah says, وَكَذَلِكَ فَتَنَّا بَعْضَهُمْ بِبَعْضٍ لِيَقُولُوا أَهَاؤُلَاءِ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنْ بَيْنِنَا And thus we have tried those with those. Allah tests us, or oh sorry, Allah tests the believers with the disbelievers, and Allah tests the disbelievers with the believers. Uh, Allah wants to raise the believers higher. And to be raised higher, you need to offer something. And sometimes you don't initiate that offer. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes us go through hardship. So we are patient. So we put up with more challenges. And we are more patient, and then Allah rewards us for that. And this is all part of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah plans your life in an optimal way. Every human being. Every human being. The qadr runs in your favor all the time. The qadr runs in your favor. But you don't see that, or we don't see that, because we insist on our perspective. We insist on our plan. But if you let the qadr unfold, and you respond to Allah with faith, trust, and humility, Qadr is designed to run in your favor. It's serving you. That's how Allah designed this world. How, this is how Allah wrote the Qadr, the fate, and the destiny of every human being. There's a hadith from the Prophet ﷺ, hadith Hassan, collected by Imam Ahmad, where the Prophet ﷺ actually indicates this, but sometimes, we don't understand the hadith or we limit the perspective we place on the hadith. The Prophet ﷺ says, Man kanat al hammahu jama'allahu lahu shamlahu aw amrahu wa ja'ala ghinahu fi qalbihi wa atathu dunya wa hiya raghima Whoever has Allah on the last day as his or her main concern. Meaning they want Allah. This person is living for Allah. They're seeking Allah. They're seeking meeting Allah on the Day of Judgment. That's the perspective from which they approach life. That's their approach to life, is I want Allah. Life is a vehicle for me 
to make it to Allah. It's an environment for me, uh, full of resources where I can pick resources and, you know, taking them as stepping stones to Allah. Take this analogy as someone is trying to cross a river and you find stones, you place, you pick stones from the river that you are afraid that would probably, you know, drown you or it may be even uh, pull you with the, with the current. You take stones from the river and you place them in front of you. you are, they, are, they become actually the means through which you cross the river and overcome that challenge. So life is like this. It's full of stones, stepping stones that you can use. Everything in life is just like this. So you place them. So someone who approaches life like this, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put so many resources at your disposal for you to use them to Allah and your goal is Allah. The Prophet ﷺ said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take care of their affairs. Meaning, Allah will manage their affairs. Allah will make things run easily, smoothly for them. And Allah will place in the heart a sense of wealth, abundance, richness, contentment. وَجَعَلَ غِنَاهُ فِي قَلْبِهِ and this is al-ghina billah. This is feeling the sufficiency and the richness because of that connection with Allah. Jazakallah khair hasan. So externally, affairs are managed. Internally, you feel no need for anything. You detach from anything. You have no attachment to anything outside because you, know, you see its real value. You see the, and you see the, the true value you're seeking is with Allah. Then the Prophet ﷺ says, وَأَتَتْهُ الدُّنْيَا وَهِيَ رَاغِمَةً And this world will come to the service of this person even if against its own will why? that shows Al-Qadr is actually working for you but your job is alignment you align yourself with Allah's command and Allah's plan when you align your heart with Allah's command what Allah loves you love what Allah loves and you do what Allah loves and you accept Allah's qadr with openness and acceptance and trust. Things will start working for you. Does this mean life will be easy like a, an easy ride? No, there will be challenges, but they will not feel as challenges. They will not feel as challenges. They will feel like beautiful rides, like challenges you're going through on your path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I think there was this, uh, again, story or analogy, which is actually very, quite expressive about this. Uh, uh, a student came to the teacher and said, you know, I'm uh, complaining about their life. My life is miserable, it's tough, and, and it's hard. There's always one calamity after the other. I don't get all I want. There's a lot of lack, etc." And the teacher was wise, so did not want to give a, a, a verbal answer because that doesn't really teach. He realized his student needed a deeper experience of learning. So he said to the student, he gave him a little bit of salt. He said, take this salt. And he gave him a small cup of water. And he said, put the salt in the water. He put the salt in the water. He said, stir it. Drink it. He put it in his mouth, spat it out. He said, that's bitter, salty. I can't sort of, I can't consume it. He says, good. He gave him a similar amount of salt. He said, come on, let's go together. And they went to a lake, sweet lake. And he said, throw the salt in the lake. He threw the salt in the lake. He said, stir it. He stirred it. He brought the same cup after cleaning it. And he took a little bit of water. And he said, now taste the water. He tell, how does it taste? He said, fresh, sweet. He says, with life, don't be like the water in the cup. Be like the lake. The same amount of bitterness, the same amount of salt, but it does not disturb. It does not disturb the freshness of the water. Right? So, this is how the believer goes through life. They're going to experience challenges, but they will not feel as their calamities. These are opportunities were for you to be patient, for you to be persistent, for you to be devout, for you to keep going. And you see them as ascending steps or steps to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
uh, tells the Prophet وسلم, here in Surah Al Araf that uh, do not feel saddened, do not let the rejection and the opposition of these people bring you down. That's their nature, they're expressing their nature, the response to the truth. And Allah mentioned why in the in other places in the Quran why He mentions the stories of the Prophet and we relate to you the stories of some of the prophets so that we add firmness to your heart. We make your heart stronger. Because the challenge is sometimes we're humans. We have that weakness and they might get overwhelming. So we need that spiritual push that will uh, empower the, the heart rather than the fear of the mind or the immediate experience. And when that grows, Again, it turns the human into a lake, can handle that little bit of salt. Not like a little bit of water that gets really salty and bitter with that little amount of salt. Cannot be, so the lake cannot be disturbed by that little amount of salt. Uh, and subhanAllah, interestingly, humans take consolation in other humans. When you are going through an experience, an illness, poverty, and then you hear about someone who went through a similar story, it actually lessens your burden because the burden is shared now. The, uh, so this is why you find a lot of, for example, self-help books are full of anecdotes, right? Stories about people, someone in similar situations, someone who did that and that's what they got. These are very informative and very inspiring because we humans, as Imam Al-Qayyim says, that the mind works on comparison. We're always comparing. We always have a reference point to compare to. So. The moment you hear, for example, people in Corona here who really lost their business or they had like, uh, they, like financially, it, it didn't do them well. When they heard how many others actually went through the same, somehow it lessens their burden. Somehow. So this shows the connection among humans as well. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us here about human nature as well. That's another side of the meaning of the stories here. That when you are not alone in the predicament and you know you are not alone on this path, even though these are people who came before you, it's going to lessen your burden. And that's why in Surah Al-Fatiha, the scholars who talked, about, talked in detail about the tafsir of Surah Al-Fatiha, we say, It's the path of the ones that you have bestowed your mercy upon. Why? Because it it makes you feel the companionship with the believers from all nations and all times. You're not alone on this path. And also, in the tahiyyat, say, At-tahiyyat lillahi wa salawatu wa tayyibat, As-salamu alayka ayyuha al-nabi, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, As-salamu alayna wa ala ibadillahi al-salihin. Right? Imagine peace be upon us and all the pious servants of Allah. Why? Feeling the companionship. You're not alone on this path. So this is an important part. And that's why the Prophet says, Alaykum bil jama'ah, be with the jama'ah, be with the group. Because humans need that relational element, that companionship. When we are alone, it's easier for us to be broken, to feel weak. Humans strengthen the spirit of other humans. All right, so, and, and by the way, uh, when, when you try to do something that's probably you think no one else did, you try to do it, you'd easily give up on it. But the moment you hear someone else did it, your spirit goes up. Automatically, you get encouraged. Uh, okay, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet sallam, about other messengers who came before and that serves many purposes again the primary purpose is actually to lift the spirit of the Prophet وسلم, remind him he's not alone in facing this response and this is just normal and things will eventually end up in in good shape Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give, give victory to the truth what is emphasized here is the ridicule so we said these stories are mentioned many times in the Quran what's emphasized in Surah Al-A'raf you will find there is the ridicule, the personal attack on the, on the prophets. Let's look at uh, 
Let's look at Prophet Nuh. Uh, verse number uh, 59. Starts 59. In verse number 60, قال الملأ من قومه إنا لنراك في ضلال مبين. The people, the elite, or the those, the troublemakers uh, among his people, they said, "We see that you are clearly misguided. Misguided. You are basically." Uh, what they were trying to say, that it's obvious that you lost it, that you don't have any guidance, you don't know what you're talking about, it doesn't make any sense what you're saying, it's ridiculously uh, off that what you came with. It's a personal attack on him, to the point that he needed to sort of defend himself at a personal level. So he said, He said, oh my people, there is no misguidance in me. There is no misguidance in me. I'm not misguided. So they, they made it about, about him. As a, there's a personal attack on him. Then the second story, the story of Prophet Hud with his people Ad. And this is actually even worse. Verse number 66, they say, قَالَ الْمَلَأُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنْ قَوْمِهِ إِنَّا لَنَرَاكَ فِي سَفَاهَا وَإِنَّا لَنَظُنُّكَ مِنَ الْكَاذِبِينَ uh, they say, those people, like the troublemakers among his people, they said, we see you in foolishness. You are a fool. Not only you're misguided, but like very degrading, condescending type of language. It's, hey, you're a fool. We see that you are in foolishness. You are steeped in foolishness. Again, a personal attack. So this is emphasized in this surah. So you see when Allah SWT reveals the stories in the Quran, Allah mentions this story in a way and the details in a way that serves the purpose of the surah. So it's not repetition. The, surah, the stories here have a different taste. The taste here you will notice is personal attack. Personal attack on the prophets. Why? Because a big part of our purpose in the surah is to console the Prophet and tell him that when they, when they uh, uh, call you a magician, a liar, a poet, a sorcerer, etc. This personal attack on you, okay, this is not a new thing and it's not about you. فَإِنَّهُمْ لَا يُكَذِّبُونَكَ right? It's not that they don't trust you. وَلَكِنَّ الظَّانِمِينَ بِآيَاتِ اللَّهِ يَجْحَدُونَ But they actually, they are, they reject Allah's signs and Allah's words. All right, so this Prophet Hud, he was called foolish. To the point that he had to defend himself, verse number 67, he said, There's no foolishness in me, like I'm not, a, I'm not a fool. And by the way, this shows that the prophets were mature psychologically. Imagine if, if someone is immature, immature psychologically and you tell them, Hey, you're misguided. They're either gonna react to this or they're gonna feel this kind of self-doubt about them. Whereas the companion, uh, the prophets, they responded with logic. They said, you're misguided. He said, I'm not misguided. That's as simple as that. You're, uh, you're a fool. You're steeped in foolishness, right? There's no foolishness in me. Simple as that. It doesn't get to them. And it shows that this spiritual strength of the prophets and messengers make, make them psychologically resilient. And uh, a famous story uh, is Umar bin Abdul Aziz, right? when he was the Khalifa, and uh, he usually rejected bodyguards, but it was still the system because if the Khalifa is assassinated, it creates turmoil in the, in the, in the state. Uh, so he was in the marketplace checking on business, how it's going. And he happens to bump into a person, uh, accidentally. So the person, and obviously, very like vulgar, disrespectful language. Uh, he says, Ahimaron ant. Like he, man gets frustrated, are you a donkey? Obviously, it's an insult, right? In English, it's like, are you a dog? Or something like that. Ahimaron ant. So the, now the bodyguards, they want to jump the guy. I go, this is the Khalifa, right? Amr al-Khattab says, La, ana Umar bin Abdul Aziz. I am Umar bin Abdul Aziz. I'm not a donkey. 
He didn't take offense. And it's not like he was faking it. He's so secure inside because when you're connected to Allah, you're secure. There's no need for external validation. Personal attack on you does not get to your heart. Because you have this, this, this um, support from Allah, this inner strength. You, your, your sense of self, your dignity is not contingent on external factors that are quite, you know, variable and they keep changing and fluctuating. They, you know, people have different, go through different moods. It's not dependent on those. You're independent of the opinion of others or of the speech of others. You're dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, yes, yeah, so the man said, Ahimarun ant, he said, La, ana Umar bin Abdul Aziz. He said, Are you a donkey? He said, No, I'm Umar bin Abdul Aziz. So the, the, the guard wanted again to, they wanted to jump the guy. Umar said, Leave him. He asked me a question, I answered him. Move on. Imagine if we can, you know, uh, go through life just like that. <laughs> No one can get to you. But the problem is, many of us are walking around looking for an opportunity to get offended. Like if someone says something, what did you say? Are you talking about me, All right? That shows you that we are actually, we are receptive, we are attracting that kind of stuff. All right, so again, this is a glimpse into what the prophets, what kind of people they were. Let's move uh, on to see Salih, alayhi salam. وَإِلَىٰ ثَمُودَ أَخَاهُمْ صالحة. Look at the humiliation. It's a little bit contextual here. The, the, the ridicule is not uh, straightforward, it's contextual. So Allah says in verse number 37, he starts the story of Prophet Salih that he, start, he, he said to his people, fear Allah, you have no true God, no one who deserves to be worshipped but him. Uh, there is a sign, a sign has come to you from Allah. This is the she camel. So let it eat from this land, the land of Allah, and do not bring any harm to it. And remember, or be mindful, how Allah made you dominant on earth after and who were destroyed, right? And Allah facilitated or gave you power over the earth to use it, build houses and uh, carve houses into mountains. Uh, so remember the bounties of Allah upon you and do not bring about mischief, do not spread mischief. Look at the arrogant ones among them, just the arrogance. So they were haughty, looking down upon you, uh, upon Salih and the believers. So, it's not like they were saying, hey, you're wrong, you're misguided, you're fool. No, they said, The arrogant ones said to the weaker ones, the simple ones, to the believers, among the good, good ones. Do you really know that Salih is, is uh, do you have a proof that Salih is sent from Allah? Do you really know that for sure? And it could also be interpreted, which is some of the scholars of Tafsir mentioned, that they didn't ask them as a question, as an inquiry, but they asked them as uh, they were pulling their feet. They said, they, they gave the wrong impression to the believers, because they already resisted, and uh, they were arrogant, acting with arrogance, looking down upon Salih alayhi salam, and the believers. Now one day they came to these believers and they said, Hey, do you know that Salih was sent by Allah? Now you're full of hope as a believer. These arrogant ones are about to believe. The Prophet ﷺ went through something like that. When the Surah of Abasa was revealed down, the Prophet ﷺ was speaking to the uh, leaders in Mecca, and he sensed some uh, positive response, some receptivity from them. So he, so he wanted to invest in that. And then Abdullah ibn Umar Maktoum, the blind person, came to the Prophet asking him about something and about Allah. The Prophet frowned in the face 
of Abdul Abdul Maktoum, like it's not time, like the, see, there is some hope here that maybe these arrogant people would actually, you know, surrender, be humble, humble, humble themselves to the truth and believe, right? So the Prophet had hope and this, this is pulling the, their, their legs. So the people of Salih, uh, the, the arrogant ones among them, the disbelievers, they set up the believer ones, and the believing ones, and they said to them, do you know that Salih is sent from Allah? So the believers said, yeah, we believe in him. Now when they said we believe in him, the arrogant ones, they said, we reject what you believe in. It's sort of, again, it's, it's a play on words, but again, it's, it's very like passively aggressive. And it's, it's, it's very uh, deceptive in the approach. The arrogant ones, they said, what you believe in, we disbelieve in. Meaning, you know, we're not going to stoop to that, to your level. And then, what did they do? They killed the miracle, which is the, the she-camel, and then they addressed Saleh. They said, okay, you, you warned us, we killed your camel. Bring your punishment. So again, a personal challenge here. Uh, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala obviously sent upon them an earthquake that destroyed them. طيب, let's come to Lut. Lut alayhi salam warned his people against, again, men approaching men with intimacy and sexuality. And uh, he said that will bring the punishment of Allah upon you. What was the response of his people? Kick them out of our town. You, you don't deserve to live in this. You're not civilized enough to be with us. You think you're better than us? You think you're poorer than us? Kick them out of the city. We want to get you out of here. Again, a personal attack. The Prophet ﷺ experienced all types of these attacks. There was a personal attack on him that you are misguided, what you came with is asatir al awwalin you know, things that you borrowed from previous nations, fairy tales, and you learned that from the Jews, from the Christians. Uh, you are fool, you are majnoon, they called him majnoon, right? You're insane, you're not, you're not okay, you have something wrong with your head. And uh, with regards to uh, Salih, they attacked the uh, companions of the Prophet they tried to kill him himself, they conspired, they brought 10 young men from each clan, right, to kill the Prophet personal attack, physically, meaning. Uh, and they also, when they conspired, what to do, they were like weighing some options, one of the options was, and Allah SWT mentions them in Surah Al-Isra, either uh, put him in a prison, until he dies, or exile him, kick him out, right, or kill him. And that's when Shaitan came in the form of a man, right, as, uh, as an old man from Najd, right, and he told them, you know, if you put him in prison, the news about him will spread and he will become like a warrior, like a freedom fighter, right, and then he will get more followers. If you exile him, he's going to rally people against you, he's going to win winners. They said, one man said, let's kill him. He said, هذا هو الرأي. He said, that's, that's what you should do. That's the solution to Muhammad. Right? So the Prophet ﷺ experienced all of those. So Allah is saying what you were experiencing is not new. And this shows the Prophet ﷺ, what he experienced is the combination of what all the Prophets and Messengers received. And that shows the higher you are with Allah, the bigger your challenges are going to be. And, but that comes with a bonus. The, the, the higher your Iman is, so the more capable, the more empowered you are by Allah to handle those challenges. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ, for example, when he was dying, he said, إِنِّي لَأُوْعَكُ كَمَا يُوْعَكُ الرَّجُلَانِ مِنْكُمْ When his uh, daughter Fatima, رضي الله عنها, she said, إِنَّكَ لَتُوْعَكْ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ You are going through the pains of death, the stupors of death. The Prophet ﷺ said, I experience double what each one of you experiences. Why? Because Allah wants to elevate him even higher. 
and higher and higher. But again, you might say, why the pain? I mean, you're experience, you're trying to experience that pain from your position. But the Prophet ﷺ, his faith empowers him over that, that pain. Uh, Shu'aib. Let's come to Shu'aib. Uh, the story of Prophet Shu'aib السلام, what they said to him قال الملأ الذين استكبروا من قومه لنخرجنك يا شعيب verse number 88 قال الملأ الذين استكبروا من قومه لنخرجنك يا شعيب والذين أمنوا معك من قريتنا أو لتعودن في ملتنا قال أولو كنا كارهين قد افترينا على الله كذبا إن عدنا في ملتكم بعد إذ نجان الله منها So the uh, troublemakers from his people those who are arrogant they said we shall kick you out يا شعيب and those who have joined you in faith or we give you another option you come back or you, you, you go back to our way of life to our faith, our religion he said what if like we, we reject both we're not, we're not going for this or for that like we're not going to you can't force us into believing in your way we would be lying if we were just to follow your ways after we have seen the truth after Allah has saved us from us for Allah saved us from that uh, so eventually they gave him a serious threat and look at again the, the composure of the prophets verse number 89 in the middle he says وَمَا يَكُونُ لَنَا أَن نَعُودَ فِيهَا إِلَّا أَن يَشَاءَ اللَّهُ رَبُّنَا We would not go back into your way of life. Right? But look at what he says. Unless Allah wills something. He's basically saying, even our guidance is not up to us. We refuse to go back into your religion or your way of life. And we will never go back. But things are not in our hands, things are in the hands of Allah. Illa ayyasha Allah. If Allah wants something, again he emphasizes tawheed, oneness of Allah. And then look at the courage that comes from faith. By the way, fear comes from being distant from Allah. Fear of the creation, fear of consequences. When a person's heart is full of connection and love of Allah, there's no place for fear. They don't know fear. So there is a trade-off between Iman and fear of other things. This is why Imam Ahmed said, Something towards man man araf Allah Whoever truly knows Allah, meaning the knowledge of faith, of Iman, they would fear nothing. They would fear nothing. So, so look at how he, how he responded to them after that threat. Uh, he said, Allah has covered everything in knowledge. Allah knows. Allah knows who you are, who we are, what's the truth and what's falsehood. And Allah knows what's going to happen. Everything's in the hands of Allah. Allah For us, with these options you gave us and the threat, serious threat, and obviously he's weak with the little people who are with him. The others, they have the power and the means. He said, Allah For us, we rely on Allah. We trust in Allah. You do what you want to do. رَبَّنَ افْتَحْ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَ الْقَوْمِ وَبَيْنَ قَوْمِنَا بِالْحَقْ وَأَنْتَ خَيْرُ الْفَاتِحِينَ He turns to Allah. Oh Allah, you settle this affair, this issue between us and our people and you are the best of judges or you are the best one to, uh, you know, settle this affair. So there was more threat from his people, verse number 90. وَقَالَ الْمَلَأُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنْ قَوْمِهِ لَأَنِ اتَّبَعْتُمْ شُعَيْبًا إِنَّكُمْ إِذًا لَخَاسِرًا uh, again, the arrogant one said to the believers, if you truly follow Shu'aib and you remain with him, you are going to be the losers because we're going to kick you out or kill you, destroy you. So it was a serious threat. The Prophet Muhammad went through the same. But look at the courage of, of Prophet Shu'aib alayhi salam. He said, do what you want. Do what you want. We put our trust in Allah. He knows everything. He's aware of everything. Oh Allah, you judge between us. That's it. 
but not saying God take a compromise it's a time of need you know I'm under pressure let me make a compromise none of that why the level of faith does not permit that level of faith of a prophet does not permit they cannot get themselves to give in and that's the beauty of faith that's the beauty of faith now someone who would not have this level of faith they would be exempt by the way like uh, some of the companions like Ammar bin Yasir Ammar bin Yasir radiallahu anhu came to the Prophet sallallahu and he said ya he came in a very bad state he said ya Rasulullah I did something horrible he said what did you do he said I insulted you he said, how come he said people took me they killed like tortured my father they tortured me they killed my mother in front of me until I say something bad about you and I, I did the Prophet sallallahu said you know, if they do it again, insult me again. It doesn't mean that companion didn't have higher level of faith, but it's not the same as, as prophets and messengers. It depends on the level of Iman. So this is why sometimes there are, ans there are answers that are not fit for everyone. There are challenges, there are challenges that are not fit for everyone. So, and this is why scholars many times actually, there's, and this is a very common thing in the books of fiqh, they would give an answer based on the faith of the person. Their assessment, their personal assessment of the faith of the person. If they see, because in Islam we have two things, rukhsa and azima. Rukhsa is an exemption. Sharia allows for that. But there is something called azima, which is basically not taking the exemption. Not taking the exemption, going the hard way. Now, if someone does not have strong faith, it's actually very problematic for them to take the hard way. It could be a real fitna and they could actually lose their faith. So what Islam really, what a, a wise faqih scholar would choose, should choose for them, the easy way out. Whereas someone who has the faith, they should be encouraged to take the azimah, the hard way. This is why uh, the woman who came to the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, inni usra'ah. وَإِذَا صُرَعْتْ فَإِنِّي أَنْكِشِفْ Like, I have fits. Maybe, uh, maybe she was epileptic. I get these fits, and when I do that, you know, I move around and my body gets exposed. The Prophet ﷺ told her, إِنْ شِئْتِ دَعَوْتُ لَكِ فَشَفَاكِ اللَّهُ وَإِنْ شِئْتِ صَبَرْتِ وَلَكِ الْجَنَّةِ If you wish, I can make dua for you and Allah would heal you from this, these fits. But if you wish, this is the rukhsa, right? Easy way out. The azima, if you wish, could be patient with that state. Live with it. And your reward with Allah would be Jannah. Which one do you choose? She said, Ya Rasulullah, Asbir. I'll be patient. I'll take the hard way. She had faith. وَلَكِنْ أُدْعُ اللَّهَ لِي أَلَّا أَتَكَشَّفْ Make dua that, that I do not expose my body when I go through these fits. So the Prophet ﷺ made dua for her. And this is the same thing. There's a debate among scholars. Shall a person take medicine or not take medicine? in certain states, right? You'll find some of the companions would say, no, no medicine. Why? For them, it's a, it's a trial that came to them from Allah, they want to go through it the hard way. Whereas the Prophet says, Tadawa wa ibadallah. O servants of Allah, seek medication. Seek medication. Okay, so matters in Islam and Sharia are not, many people like, like them to be very simplistic. They hear a hadith and they say, okay, that's a hadith, take that hadith and that's it for everyone. But we don't realize Islam is richer than this very childish approach. So again, the prophets here, Prophet Shu'aib, showed so much courage and restraint in such a, like a very scary, overwhelming situation. He was not shaken by that. Why? Because faith. It's faith. And eventually, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed them. Then Allah reprimands the people who, uh, again, do not take heed of the signs of Allah and the warnings and the messages that come from prophets and messengers. Uh, and that's a warning for the people of Quraysh. And again, we said the surah at the beginning. Don't forget the verse, uh, the second verse, which is, Kitabun anzalnahu ilayk. It's about the revelation of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu The surah is going to talk about this. فَلَا يَكُنْ فِي صَدْرِكَ حَرَجْ Do not be saddened, saddened by their response. That's consolation of the Prophet ﷺ. And third one, 
so that you warn and remind. So this is a warning for the rejectors of, of faith. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to the story of Musa alayhi salam. This is in verse number uh, 103. And it takes quite a bit of Surah Al-A'raf. And it requires a special treatment because this is probably this, the longest. This and Surah Taha is like probably the longest that we have of Surah, of the story of uh, Prophet Musa alayhi salam. Surah Taha and Al-A'raf. And they are actually quite similar. So if someone memorizes Al-A'raf and Taha, if you don't memorize very, very well, there are mutashabih, there are similar points where you actually jump over from Al-A'raf to Taha. Right? So. Uh, so these are probably some of the longest that we have about the story of Prophet Musa alayhi salam. So inshallah we will uh, deal with it. Inshallah next week conclude with Surah Al-A'raf. It serves the purpose of consolation of the Prophet sallam, but it serves other purposes as well of the Surah. Talking about the revelation, the guidance, and talking about how people respond to it. So those who respond negatively, it's a warning, it serves as a warning. Those who don't respond positive, or those who respond with acceptance, it will be a reminder, meaning an awakening of their fitrah. It's, it's a calling, it's, it's a call to home, right? It calls humans back home, back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, back to what they know, back to their pure, true nature. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Teen, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ ثُمَّ رَدَدْنَاهُ أَسْفَلَ سَافِرِينَ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ We created man in the best shape. And this also means in the best state. Humans are created believers. We're born in a state of belief, fitrah, right? ثُمَّ رَدَدْنَاهُ أَسْفَلَ سَافِلِينَ It's usually the uh, influence and the conditioning of society that brings people down. أَسْفَلَ سَافِلِينَ Down, it takes them away from their true nature. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Except for those who believe and do righteous deeds, those people return to their good nature. That's the journey of faith, by the way. That's the journey of faith. All of us have, are given this challenge of the influence of society that usually takes us away from the natural state of faith. Even in good environments. Even in good environments. So the journey is always, uh, life is, all, is always basically going back to where you started. Really, that's the story of faith. Going back to where you started. To where Allah you know, started you state of faith and belief okay so we're going to st stop here we can take a couple of questions about about the soul anything about the soul nothing khair inshallah so we will meet bi ta'ala next week jazakumullah khairan wa sallallahu wa sallam ala sayyidina muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam